Hey, real, real quick, before we get into any of this video, I would just ask that if you enjoy the video, please remember to hit that like button. And also, if you're not subscribed to our channel, please subscribe, or at least consider subscribing. All we do is talk about how we've done stuff, and we show how we do all the stuff on our farm to help others who want to start a farm. My wife and I are both full-time employees. I'm a soldier. She's a teacher. This is a first-generation farm that we started, and we don't have any family farms that are helping us. We just want to remind the you know remind society that while not everyone can be a fifth-generation farmer, you know with a massive farm, anyone can be a first-generation farmer to set the stage for that second-generation farmer. So thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy this video. PJ, what are you doing? <laughs> we smudged up the camera. Welcome back, everyone. Today's video is going to be a little bit different than most. We are just going to simply talk about the cost of pasturing animals. And I know some of you are like, the cost of it isn't that free? Grass grows, you know, naturally in spring, summer, and fall. Well, kind of. So yes, it is free in that aspect, but there's still other costs that go in with it. The bigger cost, obviously, to pasturing animals is land. Whether you're going to rent it or buy it, it's still going to cost money. The beauty of buying the land is you can always sell that land to get your money back. So you can kind of think of the land of purchase of land. You can almost think of it like a savings account, right? The money is tied up and you're still paying on it, but when the time comes, if in say five or ten years you decide, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore, you can turn around and sell your land. And if you put money into it and you do rotational grazing, so you put all these cross fences in or water lines, that's going to add profit, or sorry, it's going to add value to your land. So you may end up coming out ahead. Now are you going to come out more than what you paid for the land and all the materials and the labor of putting it all in. Yeah, you know, maybe if you bought it in you know like 2019 and you sold you know in 2021 or even today in 2022. We're gonna talk more about that. These guys are out here on pasture nine months of the year for us, right? So whatever cost we incur for um, pasturing. It's spread out over nine months rather than just three months like it is for our barn. <laughs> now, I absolutely love pasturing animals, but not enough to pasture lamb. We lose money on pasture lambing because we have a lot more losses since my wife and I are both full-time employees at jobs off the farm. I'm a soldier and she's a teacher, and it kind of makes it to where it's hard for us to dedicate a certain amount of time every day to the animals. Now we do, but we also have our kids that we want to dedicate time to and, and help them with schoolwork or just in general show them that they're loved. On pasture, these guys are really not that needy unless they're lambing. <clears throat> Up here by the water trough where you see <laughs> that brown lamb in the actual mineral feeder. We'll walk over there real quick. But where you see them at, right, that's where their water's at. And that is also where their mineral trough is. And that mineral trough travels around to every paddock that they go to, every pasture they go to. The actual water does too. We just simply disconnect it and move it to the next one. There is water provided through hydrant in every pasture. And we actually have it set up to where if we ever were to buy a different, you know, if we had the ability to buy, say, a 50 acre hay field that doesn't necessarily adjoin our farm, um, we would probably strongly consider that because I would love to turn that into more pasture and just extend our rotational grazing program all the way out. And basically everything here at the home farm be all about pasturing them and all about keeping them on pasture as long as possible. We could probably keep them on pasture for about 10, yeah, about 10 months of the year would pretty well be maxed and not have to feed hay. For two months of the year, regardless, we would absolutely have to feed hay. We just wouldn't have a choice. But this is their mineral setup. 
And fun fact, this is the only residual cost, meaning that it, oh, every day that they're on pasture, this cost me money. Get out of there. So once you're, well, I bet you that is still good. Uh, only residual cost, though, meaning that we constantly have to pay for this when they're on pasture. We get all of our minerals from Premier One. Um, they actually have packets, makes it easy to mix, and then we can buy salt at a local farm store, you know, depending on how much it costs to have them ship it or how much it costs for us to buy it in a local store. Uh, generally, that's how we always do it, but you can buy all of it directly from them if you want, and it works just fine. This right here, though, that mineral you see him chowing down on right now, I'm sorry, her, that cost me one cent per day per head. We have about 160, uh, well, about 130 ewes and ewe lambs, so we have ewe lambs that we keep every year to grow our flock, and then there's only, we didn't have very many uh, ram lambs this year, and the few that we did have, some of them already sold, and we've only got about 30 left to sell. But the moral of the story is we're just going to say for 160 of them, or we'll do it even easier. We'll do 100. So for every 100 head, right, it costs me $1 every day. Obviously, if you have more than that. So like in this case, 160 of them, it costs me $1.60 a day. And they're on pasture for, like we talked about before, 270 days. So $270 if you had 100 head is what it costs me in minerals every year just for pasture. Well worth it, and I absolutely love it. Where your costs are gonna differ a lot are going to be on your paddock sizes. So you have a lot of options. This paddock that we're standing in right now is actually right at five acres. Um, most of our paddocks are actually four and a half, and some are a little bit less at just over four acres, but majority of them are four and a half, and that's what we aim for because we're gonna grow to 350 head. And the math for that came out to how much, basically how much forage they needed to be able to stay on one pasture for five days and still have plenty and not eat all the way down to the ground. If you let them eat all the way down to the ground, your rotational grazing is just a waste. You're going to still have parasite issues and it's still going to cause you problems. If you design your paddock, which is going to be based on your operation, how big you want to get, uh, how many lambs you're going to have, how much land you have available. So many variables go into that. And it's all going to be have to, all going to have to be decided by you. So in our case, making aiming for a four and a half acre paddock for every paddock and putting all that fencing in, we're going to show an overhead view actually. I'll I'll pull one up right now on Google Maps and put it on the screen to explain this better. So the 10 paddocks that we made that are about four and a half acres approximately. And then we have two lambing paddocks. So lambing L1 and L2 are lambing paddocks. And then you have B for the barnyard. Now the barnyard is only about an acre. Uh, lambing paddock one and two are both two acres each. The moral of the story being is that 50 acres is what they are grazing for those nine months. And when they leave paddock one, after you go through everything, including the lambing paddocks in the barnyard, they will not return to lambing paddock, or sorry, to paddock one until 60 days has elapsed. And that really helps break up our parasite cycle. For the two years we've been doing rotational grazing, it has been phenomenal. We haven't had to eat worm and absolutely loving that. It did come at a cost though. All these lines that you see, those yellow lines, those are all fencing that we put up. Um, approximately 22,000 feet of fencing and I'll show you right here so all of this is woven wire um, we went to Menards to buy all this woven wire and all these are made in the USA it's the uh, northern northern brand fence I think um, anyways all of that's made in the USA the T posts some of them are reused so like this one is a reused one but most of the other lines are all new so if there was fencing on the place um, when we bought it, if it didn't line up with what we needed, we actually pulled that fence out and moved it completely. Anyhow, um, the roles of fencing at the time, because we did this in early 2020, the roles of fencing were about $189 each. 
and each T post, six foot T foot, no, T post that was six foot tall, was four dollars and thirty cents. Like I said, at, at the grand scheme of things, it ended up costing us about a dollar a foot, and that includes your T post, all the ties, um, the fencing itself, all of our wooden corner posts that we put in. That's what it averaged out to was a dollar a foot. A dollar a foot is costly, but it's still very much so worth it. And we would absolutely do it again if we bought more land and was able to transform our hayfield into more paddocks. The benefit is phenomenal. The other thing that I should have showed you down there when we were by the mineral trough was all these water spigots. And these water spigots, so in this case, there's actually one right here that services four paddocks. And almost all of them can service four paddocks but the way it falls, some of them are servicing the same paddock twice. Um, not a big deal. It still works just fine. It sort of adds a little extra cost if you can't get it to where you're just putting the one there to service those four paddocks. But either way, the, uh, the water at that time, we ran all uh, PEX line, all one inch PEX line. And that cost us a little over $1,500 between the PEX line and the spigots and I've got the spigots marked on that map too I'll show you exactly how that water line went right now so you can understand better what I'm talking about in the uh, water realm we do have a couple of paddocks that have a pond in them but if the ponds you know if they get to a point where they're not holding water anymore I'm not necessarily opposed to just filling them in because I can use that ground, even though it's not a lot, I can still use that ground to grow grass and easily, you know, make it to where they have more to eat. If it were me, I would just service every paddock with water and not just the ones that don't have a pond because you never know when that pond's going to dry up. That's basically what I'm getting at. Now, if you don't want to start by putting permanent paddocks in, you know, we went two years before we put permanent paddocks in. Before that, we were actually using some fence that we made ourselves using uh, a ten tensile fence, I think is what it's called. It's like construction fence, you know, the orange netted fence that you see, except for it was black. And then we got uh, fiberglass poles from Orschlands, and we basically made our own so you could walk around and you could just step on it to push that post in the ground. And then, you know, two, three days later, whenever you want to rotate your animals, you just go back in, pull them up real quick, and move them. And if you had two, so in this paddock, for instance, let's say I wanted to split it into three. So let's say I have one fence line down there by where that mineral trough is, and then I have another one right here. If you have two of those temporary fences, or nets, or whatever you want to call them, Premier One does sell nets, electric nets, and they work really well. Um, we actually have a... Uh, friend that used them and he loved them um, they keep predators out because they're electrified fortunately the fencing that we made was not electrified but you could make your own electric one too but if you had two of them right so whatever you're splitting up if you've got two that means you could split that this paddock right here into third so when they're in that first part of the paddock right, you have that fence up this now once they leave this or sorry, once they leave the first part and they go to the second part, you still have to have both of those temporary fences. Up. But once they go from the second to the third part, you can take that first temporary fence down and you can move it. In this case, we'd move it to this next paddock to create their next, uh, you know, their next paddock for them to graze on. And then when they leave this one that we just that we had made, right, we take that fence and we move it up to. It is a bit of a headache to move the fences, uh, especially in our case, you know, like I said, full-time jobs off the farm um, and, you know, having family and stuff. That part wasn't so good and part of the reason that we kind of pushed ourselves away from it. Now, at this point in our farm, I have considered just getting um, an electric net and basically splitting all of our paddocks in half and then making the animals put more pressure on each paddock or each you know so they'd have to put more pressure on this one for instance for those five days they're here and they're gonna have to eat some of the stuff that they don't want to eat but the risk you run with that is 
they're going to eat whatever they like to eat. They're going to eat it down to the dirt. And unfortunately, that bottom four inches of grass, that's where you get your parasites. And that's not what we want. So would I like to? Yes. And it would help pressure out some of the sage grass. That's what this brown junk is. It's They don't eat it. And I don't blame them, I guess, because from all the research, it apparently it has a bitter taste to it. I don't know. I haven't ate it. But from the description of it, I don't, it doesn't sound like something I'd want to eat. But pressing some of that out would be nice. And then the other thing is, is that right now, you can see how spread out these guys are. We said 160 of them. This is how spread out they are. There's, uh, there's a lot of space between them. Now, once we get to 350 and basically have a double of this, they're kind of going to be everywhere at that point. There's going to be some spots that they're not in. That's okay. But overall, it's going to look like, you know, they've got the whole paddock filled up. And that could be good depending on what you're aiming for, I guess. Like I said, if you're wanting to leave them on longer than five days and take that risk of them, uh, you know, because day six is when parasites hatch. So, like, when they walk in and they're defecating, that manure has those larvae eggs in it. And six days later, it's going to hatch. So if you move them on, say, day five, the chances of them now is there's some that probably hatch early. I'm sure there is. But not all of them are going to be hatched, and they're not going to pick up more parasites here. And take them. Or at least they're not as likely to. So that's that's another reason that we kind of went that way instead of um, using that temporary netting fence. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with that netting fence. It's just not what we wanted to do. <clears throat> But overall, that is pretty well a general tour of, you know, what our rotational grazing program is and what all it entails and how much it kind of costs to get you there. Now, I know that those prices are from you know, early 2020, and I, I understand that it's substantial. We actually looked before we made this video um, a couple of days ago just to see how much it would be. And now, if I was going to do that same 22,000 feeding fencing, I would be looking at about $40,000 to do all the exact same fencing. That does not include water lines, it's just fencing. But about $40,000 would get me the exact same setup. So the same uh, woven wire fencing, the same eight foot spacing for all of my T posts, and the same H, uh, H posts that we make at all of our corners. So it, it's went up a lot, but you're gonna have to research in your individual area to see what your exact cost is gonna be. But Red Brand Fencing does have a very useful calculator on their website. And if you just Google Red Brand Fence Calculator, it will take you to that link. You can go to that uh, calculator they have, which is a overlay of Google Maps for your place. And it will show you exactly, well, really close to how much fencing you need. When we did it, it was really close. I think we were off by like 150 feet of fencing, which was in our favor, we actually had 150 feet extra. So in that case, it's not a big deal. But one of those things that it's a, it's a really useful tool to have, because like I said, it'll tell you how much fencing you need. It'll tell you all kinds of things about what you want to know. Um, if you are going to use the electric netting to separate your paddocks and stuff, or to break your property into multiple paddocks, I would highly suggest still putting woven wire up around your perimeter that will make your life a little easier and it'll also keep it to where you know, if you're letting them out for a little while they could roam the whole area so like in the spring when the grass is a little more sparse when it's first starting to grow or same thing in the fall but overall i hope you enjoyed it i uh hope you are learning something from our channel if you have questions make sure you put them in the comments below we will answer all of them the only ones we do not answer are spam so if you're spamming it you're wasting your time we're just going to leave the comment but thanks for watching hope you enjoyed it have a blessed week and make sure you tune in for the next video that's going to talk about this barn right here behind us i'll show you i guess this barn right here behind us we're going to talk about the cost of confinement that way you can contrast the two and see which one might be better for you for us the mix of the two is definitely the best so again thanks for watching have a blessed week we'll see you next time